All right. Uh, I want to begin uh, uh, this morning with um, our second sermon on Psalm 60, no, Psalm 46. And um, Psalm 46 is um, a psalm that we want to ponder upon, contemplate, um, and uh, meditate upon uh, so that um, we can be assured of God's presence, God's protection, and God's power even during a pandemic like the one we are facing. Now, uh, I want to begin by just reading the whole psalm, and uh, our focus is still in verse 1, and we have so much to cover uh, there in verse 1 because of how this thing applies to us uh, today, uh, in essence. So Psalm 46, verse 1, it says that God is our refuge and strength, a helper who is always found in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not be afraid. Though the earth trembles and the mountains topple into the depths of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with its turmoil, there is a river. Its streams delight the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. God is within her. She will not be toppled. God will help her when the morning dawns. Nations rage, kingdoms topple, the earth melts when he lifts his voice. The Lord of hosts is within us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come and see the works of the Lord who bring devastation on the earth. He makes war cease throughout the earth. He shatters bow and cuts spear to pieces. He bends up the chariots. Stop your fighting and know that I am God. Exalted among the nations, exalted on the earth. Yahweh of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Now when we began looking at this psalm last week, I mentioned that from what I have uh, studied and looked at this psalm, the key theme of the psalm is the presence of God. And therefore, I have actually titled this psalm or this sermon or this sermon series God is with us. God is with us. I wanted, it, I wanted to put it in that way so that we realize that it is the very presence of God that is carrying us through whatever circumstance we find ourselves in. There is a guarantee of the presence of God. And I thought this, um, this, I titled this sermon, God is with us, because of a few verses that uh, that theme recurs. And in verse 1 it says, God is our refuge and strength, a helper who is always found in times of trouble. He's always there. He's always found. Another version uses the, uh, uh, it says, the ever-present one in times of trouble. He is the ever-present help in times of trouble. He is there. And in verse 5, it says, God is within her. God is within her. She will not be troubled. God will help her when the morning dawns. God is with her. Verse 7 says, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. That's another one. God is with us. The Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies is with us. And again, the last verse, verse 11 says, 
Yahweh of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. So, yes, um, refuge and stronghold and strong shelter and uh, a strong tower is coming through uh, very strong also in the psalm. But I think uh, it, 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 it builds on the fact that God is with us. And because God is with us, therefore the strong shelter and the shield that he is, is there because of his own presence with us. God is with us. And uh, I also mentioned last week uh, in our last sermon that uh, uh, we are in the second wave of this new variant uh, that has come and it seems to be stronger and faster and it is uh, much worse than the first wave and uh, a lot of people have succumbed to this virus and so um, normally when a pandemic hits a country or a place uh, people run and seek God but that has not been our response in this pandemic. People are not flogging to churches. Uh, people are not rushing. Even when church was open, people were scarce in churches to show that they were not really grasping the gravity of this virus and this pandemic. And therefore we are hit with a second wave, with a new variant. And if our response remains the same, we will be hit with a third wave and another new variant which will also be stronger and faster because we are not responding to what is happening around us. We need to have a response that calls us back to God, the response that brings us back into the house of God, the response that says to the government, you need now the churches to come together and to pray. Because now you are shutting the churches down and you are focusing on other matters and other avenues for help when this crisis also needs us to cry back to God. And if our people, and if we do not uh, pay attention to these things, we will, we will be in this situation for quite a long time until we are all surrendered and all on our knees before a holy God and we all cry out to him, Abba Father, help us, rescue us, deliver us, be our shelter, be our refuge, protect us from this thing. Until we come there, in that situation, our situation, I'm afraid, will not, will not give us a break. It will not ease, it will just intensify. But when we concluded last week, I was reading also uh, other Psalms which solidify, supports, the idea of God is our refuge. God is our protector. God is our shelter. God is our strong shelter. God is our strong tower. God is our shield and our protection. And that comes right out of that verse, verse 1, that says, God is our refuge. That word refuge right there speaks to this very idea of strong shelter, solid shield, protection guaranteed, high tower, strong and high tower, which means the enemy cannot penetrate this. The enemy cannot come through we are protected, it's like this strong, high
high tower and a castle that is so protected and guarded. But now the guard here is not our local security companies, but it is God. It is not Chad or national or school. These are all these uh, security companies and there's another one called FBI. Even though they, they, they may have nice names, this one, this security we are talking about is of God himself. This security will not fail. This security cannot be breached. This security is guaranteed. It is God himself. The verse says God is our refuge. He himself is that refuge. The righteous run to him and they are saved. And that is why God is our refuge and our protector. Having said that, having said that, there is a question. There is a question. And this question has troubled a lot of Christians and even non-Christians. How is God our protector? How is God our shield and shelter, strong shelter, when evil still touches us? How is that even possible? How do you guarantee the security and the safety of the children of God and say, God is our refuge and yet Yet, we get the news. One of us was just hit by coronavirus and has succumbed to coronavirus just last night. Just last night. In one of our sister churches. It has happened. What guarantee do I have that God will protect me and my family when evil seems to just penetrate the shields around me. Let's look at the reality because we, 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 we see these things. I'll say this. Believers are not immune to evil. That's number one. Be believers are not immune to being touched by evil. They are not. Believers also get sick and die. Believers also get hijacked and raped. Believers also are being persecuted and slaughtered and beheaded in many countries in the world today. Believers also give birth to children who are mute, who are blind, who are deaf, who are crippled. Today, believers, believers have been victims of violent crimes and robberies. This is the reality. This is a factual truth. How is then God our strong shelter and shield? How is then God our protector when these things are so dear in our lives? That's the question. How is God their very present help in times of trouble? How is it the ever present help? How is God our refuge and strength? A helper who's always found in times of trouble. But that's what the verse says. The verse says that. That's what the word of God says. It says God is our refuge and strength. He is. And God is a helper who is always found in times of trouble. He is. That one is the truth. It is a guarantee. It is what God says in his word. I showed you last week in many other verses that this is not a standalone verse. There's many other verses that says this thing, these things. So now, how can this verse be true? And then I have this reality that is also true. How is that? Now, in our an attempt to answer this question, we have to ask a few questions too. 
in order to get to what we should get out of our text. The first thing we should ask is, is God's protection physical or spiritual? Meaning, does God guarantee our physical protection or our spiritual protection? Because if you notice, all of these realities that I have stated are mainly just physical. After all, we are physical and spiritual beings, but therefore it is always a concern when things touch my flesh. It seems like I am more focused on my flesh than on my spirituality. Everything that is around me is geared towards making my flesh comfortable. Everything. I do not go out of my way to try and have my spirituality be more comfortable the way I do with my flesh. I am more concerned about my flesh than I am concerned about my spirituality. That is why people would rather enjoy the luxuries of this life and neglect their spirituality. Because they are more concerned about how they feel as far as the physical is concerned. People will not have time for their spirituality. They will not have time to come to church. They will not have time uh, to, to, to come into the house of God and worship with children of God. But they will make time to make sure that their physical is comfortable. They will wake up any hours, they will sleep late at night to make sure their physical is comfortable. They will take long trips to make sure their physical is comfortable. People will not want to drive uh, 40, 50 kilometers to go to a good church for their spirituality, but they will travel 100 kilometers to go to work so that they can have their physical comfortable. People do that. And that is just natural with us. And that is why when we are touched in the physical, we question the spiritual. Isn't it amazing? We question God when things touch us on physical. But when things are going well spiritual, we don't question God. We're okay. But when you are even suffocating spiritually, you don't even question God. You are like, no, I'm busy. God, I'm busy. There was a video uh, a couple of years ago uh, when someone was saying, I don't have time, I don't have time, until they themselves were told, you have cancer. And all of a sudden they have time to go to the doctor. All of a sudden they have time to go for chemo. All of a sudden, and, and we're talking about these big corporate guys who are always so busy to be in the house of God. And yet, when it touches their physical, they'll be time. Now, that's the question we have to look at to say, is God's protection here? Is God our refuge and shelter here? Referring to our physicality. Is that what this is? Second question we have to also ask is Does God allow his children to be touched by evil? Meaning, does God allow bad things to happen to his own children? And if yes, why? That's another question we have to ask. And in that one, I'll just refer you to his own son, Jesus Christ, and show you how bad things happened to him, the one who was good. You know, sometimes as people, we think we deserve better. We think we deserve good. We think everything that comes to us must be uh, of highest quality because we are children of God and we're good. And yet we're not good. None of us is good. We are only made righteous because of Jesus Christ, not because of us. We are sinners. We offend God every day. 
We are only able to stand because we stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not our own. And therefore, it is not because we are good that these uh, good things should come to us. We're there. We must celebrate. We must celebrate when good things come to us because that's the message of God. It's not because we are good. It is because God is gracious to us. Now, what should be a believer's response to these things? How should we respond in this situation? How should we tackle this idea uh, right here? There's, a, there's two verses that really I, I, would, I would like to take you to. But the first one, uh, I think, will be a clear um, a slam dunk uh, when we read this verse. Second Corinthians chapter four. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse sixteen. We will read it to chapter five, verse five. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse sixteen to chapter five, verse five. And when you look at the second. Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, it says, Therefore we do not keep up. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. For we know, chapter 5 verse 1, for we know that if our temporary earthly dwelling is destroyed, we have a building from God an eternal dwelling in the heavens not made with hands indeed we groan in this body desiring to put on our dwelling from heaven since we have been since we are clothed, when we are closed clothed we will not be found naked indeed we groan while we are in this tent burdened as we are, but we do not want to be unclothed, but clothed, so that mortality may be swallowed up by life. And the one who prepared for us, let me read that again, and the one who prepared us for the very purpose, for this very purpose is God, who gave us the Spirit as a down payment. So, God Himself has prepared us for what? For this very purpose. For this very purpose. And He has given us his spirit as a down payment, as a guarantee that we have a body in heaven. Even though this body that I'm in right now is perishing, is being destroyed, I am being renewed day by day in the inner man. I do not look at what is seen. I do not look at what is physical, but I look at what is spiritual. So the perspective of a child of God should not be focusing on what is physical, but what rather is spiritual. We need to be focusing on things that are eternal and not things that are temporary because that which is temporary is fading and will be done away with. But that which is spiritual 
is permanent and it will remain. And that is what we are called to do. And then it says there that as well, for it says for our momentary light affliction. We are going through affliction. Then there's two uh, things that describes this affliction there. It says this affliction is momentary. So it's not permanent. It will pass. It is momentary. It's only here for a while. It's only here for a short while. It's only here for a moment. But also, it's not heavy, but light. It is not a heavy affliction that we are going through. It is a light affliction. It is momentary and it is light. And this very affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable weight, eternal weight of glory. That's what the affliction is for. That's what the momentum affliction exists for. It is there for the purpose of producing the incomparable eternal weight of glory. That's why. That's the why. Because when you look back at the glory that you will receive and compare it with the weight of affliction that you had, you will see how incomparable the weight of glory compared to the weight of affliction which is just light and not heavy, like glory that we will see. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. So when the, when the word of God says, God is our shelter and our refuge, he guarantees, he guarantees our inner security. The eternal security, if you like. God guarantees us that he will protect us. And that is why Jesus goes as far as to say, my father is the chief shepherd. He is the good shepherd. He himself is the one who is holding us in his hand and no one is able to snatch us from the father's hand. So when we depart from this world, when we go, and it doesn't matter how we go, but when we go, to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. To uh, depart from this world is to land and arrive in the presence of Him and it is to be clothed. And we are groaning because we want to be clothed. And when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For there is a burning, not made with hands, that is being prepared or has been prepared by God himself in heaven for us. And that is our comfort. That is what answers this question. How is God's protection on his children. This protection is primarily, primarily spiritual and not physical. Yes, sometimes it's also physical. You and I are sitting here. You and I are there. You and I are in the comfort of our chair. We're not laying in a hospital bed because of his divine protection upon you, because of his mercy upon you. You are not struck by a cancer or something, or maybe you are, and yet your soul and your spirit is renewed day by day. And that is what Paul says, we do not give up. Why? Though my outer body, though my flesh, Though my physical is being destroyed, is finishing, 
It's depleting. I am being renewed in the inner man, day by day, every day. How do I know that? How do I know that? God has prepared us for this very purpose and has given us his spirit as a down payment. Because I have the spirit of God, the reason I cry about Father is because of the spirit that is in me. It is the down payment I have in Christ and that demonstrates that he is, he is my refuge and he is my shelter and he is my strong tower. The second place I want to take you to is in Luke chapter 13. I want you to see something very interesting of how Jesus responds to these things. And I'm finishing off with this. Luke chapter 13 verse 1 to 5 uh, is the section I want you to see. Luke 13 verse 1 to 5 and it says there at that time some people came and reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices and he responded to them do you think that these Galileans were more sinful than all Galileans because they suffered these things? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as well. Verse 4. All those 18 that the Tower of Siloam fell on and killed, do you think they were more sinful than all people who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as well. Wow. Wow. Two incidents. Two incidents. One man made incident. Evil touched these people. These people were killed by Pilate. They were in the, in the temple. They were actually in the house of worship. They were bringing their sacrifice. They were trying to offer sacrifices there. Their blood was spilled along with their sacrifice. They were killed in the temple. And these people are coming to Jesus and saying, what do you say about such an incident where people were murdered, even in the house of God? By Pilate, the guy who came at night to Jesus and asked and said, Rabbi, we know that we are from God. He did that. And Jesus' response is pointing to sin. He doesn't point you to the dead people. He is pointing you to everyone who is alive and he says, do you think those people were more evil than the ones who were left? And he says, no, I tell you, they were not. It's not because they were more evil. But this is to call upon you to repent or otherwise you will perish like that. Now, I want to say to us, maybe Corona has not touched us. Don't think you are better or you have protected yourself so well. Don't even think like that because you're no better. Repent or we will perish likewise. The second incident was like an accident. A tower fell, killed 18 people. And Jesus says, don't think those people were more evil than other people who live in Jerusalem. He says, unless you repent, he is pointing us to sin and he's pointing us to repentance. And he's pointing us to the lack of repentance, which will be the perish if we do not repent. These things touching others are supposed to be a wake-up call for all of us. It should not be, oh, how unlucky 
They've never saw such a thing as unlucky. How unlucky they were. No, it's not that. You have been spared because the grace of God is still upon you to give you a chance of repentance. Repent or perish, says Jesus. Repent or perish. The protection of God upon us is guaranteed, but guaranteed for our spirituality. Because even Jesus had to go through physical pain and physical suffering. Even Joseph, who is a type of Christ, had to go through some physical suffering and affliction. But yet, not his soul. Not his soul. And I think that is what helps us to understand the protection of God should not be subjected to our physical conditions and therefore doubt the protection of God just because your physical conditions is not so safe. God is not guaranteed any protection of our physical, but rather guaranteeing the protection of our spiritual. And he gives us the spirit of the living God, the Holy Spirit, as a guarantee in us. God is our strong tower, our solid and strong shelter and shield, and he is our strength, and he is the very present help in times of trouble. Let us pray. Our Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, grace upon grace has abounded to each and every one of us, every family. And I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your mercies. My God, I pray that we touch the lives of those who have been touched by evil, by sickness, by a virus, by death, who have been touched by some form of affliction, that God, may you strengthen them and comfort them through these things. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Be their strength and be their support. Be their solid shield in the name of Jesus, I pray. And I pray, Father, that may your word dwell richly in our hearts, that we may be careful to observe and to abide by. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.